Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 7. Johannes Capius and the Pietist of Pennsylvania from America's Assignment with Destiny by Manly P. Hall. Johannes Capius and the Pietist of Pennsylvania. It has been claimed that the Rosicrucians and possibly other initiate orders of Europe established themselves in the American colonies during the closing years of the 17th century. The best publicized candidate for the honor of having brought the esoteric schools to the New World was the German theological student and mystical pietist, Magister Johannes Capius. It is believed that Capius was initiated into the mysteries of Kabbalistic philosophy during his university days by the celebrated esotericist Christian Nahr. Bern von Rosenroth. This learned man edited and translated numerous works relating to obscure subjects and is especially remembered for his Kabbalah Dinudata. He was a mystic and published a collection of hymns under the following stimulating title. Papias lived for some years as an anchorite in a cave in what is now Fairmount Park, Philadelphia and died in 1708 as a result of exposure and extreme austerities. The direct cause of death was tuberculosis. John Capius came of a Danchel family of Sebegenbergen. He was educated in the University of Helmstadt and regarded Dr. Ferbertius, professor of theology at Helmstadt, with special esteem. In a letter addressed to Dr. Ferbertius, Capius opens with the salutation. Your Magnificence. On February 7, 1694, Capius chartered the ship Sarah Maria, of which Captain John Tanner, an Englishman, was the master. For the sum of seven pounds, and with his small band of German pietists, began the long and dangerous journey to Pennsylvania. They reached their destination after numerous hardships about ten weeks later. From Zox the German pietist of provincial Pennsylvania. The only known likeness of the Magister from the original painting by Dr. Christopher Witt, now in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Capius was 23 years old when he arrived at Germantown. Finding this bustling community too worldly, the group retired into the depths of the lower Wissahickon woods where they built a hermitage. Here they formed themselves into the Society of Women of the Wilderness, where they consecrated their efforts towards spiritual preparation for the millennium. The brethren became known as the Hermits of the Ridge, and combined their spiritual ministrations, horoscopy, magic, divination, and healing. Capius is credited with lying out the first botanical garden in America. He died sitting in a chair in his garden, surrounded by his sorrowing disciples in the 35th year of his life. He was buried in the area, but the location of the grave is not known. His community passed with him, although a few of his celibate followers survived him by many years. Most of the group joined the Mennonite community at Ephrata, and others returned to the simple religious life to the Georgetown citizens. The little sect of solitudinarians left little more than a gentle but eccentric tradition in the New World. In the library of the Franken Institutions at Halle, in Saxony, there is a manuscript in the autograph of Pastor Heinrich Muhlenberg, which describes the death of Capius. Feeling that the end was near, the magister called in his trusted friend, Daniel Gleiser, he handed Gleiser a small chest or casket securely sealed and told him to cast it into the Schuylkill River in a place where the water was deep. Geisler carried the curious box to the river bank and decided to hide it there until after the Magister's death. When he returned to the bedside of the dying Capius, the master raised himself on his elbow and rebuked Geisler for disobeying his instructions and concealing the casket. Geisler, convinced that Capius had strange powers of second sight, went back and threw the small chest into the water. As it fell into the stream, the sealed box exploded, and for some time, flashing of lightning and great roaring sounds came out of the river. 
Papias, writing in 1699, explained the origin and doctrines of his order. The Piscists were conscientious objectors to the corruptions existing in organized theologies. Their reforms were accompanied by ecstasies, revelations, interpretations, illuminations, in-speakings, prophecies, apparitions, changing of minds, transfigurations, translations of bodies, fastings, paradisiacal representations of voices, melodies, and sensations. It is difficult to conceive that the Rosicrucians, as they were known through their original documents, would they claim to such procedures? Pietism, a 17th century mystical sect, arose modestly in Frankfurt as a spiritual revolution against the intellectual orthodoxy of German Protestantism. It spread moderately, and the members gained inspiration and comfort from the mystical teachings of Jacob Bema. Its principal leaders were Philip Jacob Spencer and August Hermann Franke. It was Spencer who instructed the famous Collegia Pietis, a kind of meeting of minds for the study of sacred matters. Franke, a Hebrew and Greek scholar, was learned, virtuous and industrious, and much admired in the community where he resided. The Pietus held many Puritan convictions, indulged millenarian speculations, and dabbled in mystic arts, and their approach to religious matters is said to have most resembled the devotional concepts of the early Franciscans. The principal emphasis was upon religious experience as the direct means of attaining Christian insight. The Moravians are considered a direct offshoot of pietism, as to a degree was the Methodist revival under John Wesley. Although the pietist community in Pennsylvania were given to mystical speculation, even to a little Kabbalism and folk magic, few genuine Rosicrucian landmarks have been discovered among their remains. They were religious enthusiasts, and the inner circle was so devout in its practice of continence that it became extinct within 50 years. Magister Capius seems to have studied astrology and the metaphysics of Jacob Bema and relics relating to these subjects are scattered about the Valley of Ephrata. Some of the pietists gave fault to alchemy, attempted the calculation of the millennium, located water with the divining rod, and wore magical amulets and talismans. They were second Adventist, and a few believed that they would be translated bodily into the spiritual world without suffering physical death. Dr. Julius Friedrich, Saxon was the principal historian of the German town communities which flourished in and about Lancaster County, Pennsylvania during the 18th and 19th centuries. In his book, The German Pietist of Provincial Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, 1895, and The Diarium of Magister Johannes Capius, Lancaster, 1917, he attempted to prove that the Capius brethren were Rosicrucians as the original pietist never claimed such an association. Dr. Zoxy based his conclusions upon circumstantial evidence. He advanced seals, signets, ornate symbolic crosses, fragments of mystical rites, and certain books and manuscripts discovered in the area to support his opinions. These relics, though indicating a devotion to metaphysical speculation, are not sufficiently Rosicrucian in themselves to justify their acceptance as prime facie evidence. Some of these religious curiosities may be authentic productions of the society or its members, but until it is determined how and when they were brought to the New World and by what authority, it is unwise to jump to conclusions. Many of the immigrants brought with them all of their worldly goods, and we cannot assume that a man belonged to a secret society merely because one or two books dealing with his society and available to anyone were found among his effects. Through the courtesy of the daughter of the late Dr. Zoxy, it has been possible to examine the Rosicrucian manuscript formerly belonging to him and some other German mystical books which he regarded as indicating Rosicrucian influence. Zimmerman, the astronomer who predicted the end of the world in 1694, was a close friend of Capius. 
Certainly the prophecy was a failure, and it scarcely seems reasonable that the Rosicrucian Brotherhood should move to Pennsylvania via the good ship Sarah Maria, and there organize themselves out of existence by the extremeness of their vows and religious obligations. On the other hand, it is quite possible that Capius was a member of one of the semi-secret Adventist movements, which had strong followings in Germany and the Low Countries. His manner of life indicates that he was bound by religious obligations and bound others to himself and the cause which he represented by similar vows. He did not, however, fulfill the requirements set forth in the Manifestos of the Rosy Cross, which insisted that members of the society remain inconspicuous by reframing from any public practices that might draw attention to themselves. Because almost nothing is actually known about the mystical convictions of the Capians. Their part in the transference of esoteric lore from Europe to America has been considerably exaggerated. There is nothing whatever to prove that as a sect they were more than they appeared to be, and they laid down most impermanent footings. Individual members were acquainted with the reformation projected by the secret societies on the continent and in England. But these signs and portents were interpreted as foreshadowing the approaching millennium. The pietists could scarcely have been devoted second Adventist, had they any vision of an extensive program for the building of a new social order in the Western Hemisphere. Nor did their activities imply any plan for the future or any program for the expansion of the philosophical or mystical aspects of their belief. There is not even the suggestion that Capia selected a successor or had any intention of transferring any authority, spiritual or temporal. Among the unusual religious groups that settled in Pennsylvania were the Mennonites, the Labadists, the Dunkers, the Niyu Gabokamen, the Shankthoders, and the Moravian Brethren. Most of these sects held convictions that could be interpreted as mystical. In all probability, however, the Rosicrucian descent was established considerably earlier by the English colonists of Virginia, the mystics of the Wissahickon, according to the actual words of Capius, shared the convictions and perpetuated the doctrines of the Quietist and Kiliast, who struggled for existence among the Protestant communities of Germany and Switzerland. The Pietists were channels through which books on Kabbalism, alchemy, astrology, and the Hermetic arts reached the New World. Thus, they contributed to the westward movement of the Philosophic Empire. Their own practices, however, detracted seriously from their usefulness as reformers or educators, and their influence was limited to the neighborhood wherein they dwelt. Capius was a devout man, probably well learned but most of his followers were more earnest than informed, and there seems to have been no vision among them of a broad or enduring ministry. This order of the mustard seed never fulfilled the promise of the parable. It not only failed to increase, but also perished in the foreign soul. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Rosies, Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.